Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm Grace Robinson, director of the Gadsden Art Center and Museum, and pleased to be here talking with some of our award winners from the Art in Gadsden uh, juried exhibition of fine art. This is our 33rd year, and we are pleased to be able to say we've never missed a year of Art in Gadsden, even last year when many things were shut down. Um, I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors who made this exhibition and our awards for artists possible. So um, this is presented in partnership with Quincy Main Street, um, and they're a very valuable partner in helping to revitalize downtown Quincy. Um, this is presented by Thomas Hell Ferguson, TDS Telecom, uh, sponsored by Lines, Hinson and Lines, and Black Fig. And we appreciate our award sponsors, again, um, who made it possible to offer very strong awards for our artists. Um, Doug Crowley Insurance Services, Capital City Bank, Iron Oak Wealth Management, uh, and Full, Ar Full, Full Earth Farm. So thank you so much to all of these sponsors, as well as our granting organizations that help with uh, programs and general operations at Gadsden Arts. Thank you um, to all of these for supporting our programs. So we were very fortunate to have a distinguished juror for the 33rd Art in Gadsden, and she was such a pleasure to work with, um, and that is Aja Roche, who is gallery director at the Foster Tanner Fine Arts Gallery on campus at FAMU, Florida A&M University, and she teaches museum studies courses there. Um, she's an internship host for museum studies and arts administration students. Uh, she's curated exhibitions for multiple cultural venues in our area, like 621 Gallery, the Meek Eaton Black Archives, and the Havana History and Heritage Society. Um, Aja is finishing her, her um, doctorate degree at Florida State University. She completed her BA in Fine Arts from FAMU and her master's in interdisciplinary studies from New York University. So she is very, very accomplished um, in the field. And again, we were so fortunate to have her during this show. She, she spent days previewing the artwork before she came to judge. She spent a day on site with us and then she um, gave a talk about the work afterwards and we'll share some of her comments tonight. So I'd like to start by um, inviting you to type any questions that you might have um, of any of our artists in the chat. Um, and then Angie or I will moderate those questions as we proceed. And um, we'd like to start by talking about our third place award winner. Um, and he could not be with us this evening. So he has answered some questions in advance so that Angie and I can um, share those and talk about his work. So third place, sponsored by Full Earth Farm, went to Matthew Brady for his photograph entitled Albrack Fog, uh, made in 2020. And that is a silver gelatin print that is fairly small. It's about 10 by 10 inches. And of that piece, our jurors said that it's unassuming in scale, but so alluring in its moody, even melancholy dispositions. She was just really drawn by the emotive power of this piece. So I will um, ask Angie to join me. I will ask the questions and Angie's going to share with you um, some of Matthew Brady's comments. Um, so our first question of Matt was, um, the moment captured in the painting is really wonderful. Can you talk about what attracted you to this image? And was this from an event in your life? Matt says, we had passed by this farm many times in our travels within the averaging region of France. And I had taken a number of photographs of this scene under various lighting conditions. And on this particular morning, we were headed out on, from our base in Languille, a town famous for its knives. And as we descended into the farm's small valley, the farm was shrouded in a thick fog. Taking out my medium format film camera and tripod, I took five photographs over a period of 20 or 30 minutes as the fog slowly lifted. Abrak Fog was one of those images. So can you tell us about the day that the photo was taken? Um, was this a predetermined photograph location for you? So like you said, we were just out to explore what we considered to be a particularly wild and rugged yet beautiful area of France. Fortuitous happenstance brought, that I brought my camera 
and a small farm and convective bog together. So your photography practice has had a series of starts and stops over the years. Um, how have brief periods away from the medium helped you improve when you return to photography? Well, I never really left photography, but I did leave the business after moving to Florida. I continued working in my dark room, experimenting with printing materials, printing family photos, and doing the occasional portrait. And it was after I retired that I got back to the medium and large format cameras, making photographs that I would hope to, would get into art shows like Art and Gadsden. So, so much of your work appears to be landscapes. What role does your history working as a city planner play in your selection of your subject matter? Truth to tell, my partner and I started out as wedding and event photographers in Southern Connecticut. I can only recall two or three cityscape projects. My time in urban planning was more in the specialty area of geospatial analysis and computer mapping, but I was never very far from a camera and almost always carried the marvelous Rolle 35 with me. My tendency is to photograph things that my mind's eye sees are interesting. For the past several years, interesting landscapes like Albrecht Fog seem to be what attract my attention along with the centuries old buildings in Europe. So um, why black and white photography? Well, color isn't everything. In my view, a black and white photograph can convey a great deal more visual drama than one in color. I believe, I believe that had Albrecht Fog been a color photo, it would have been just another ho-hum picture. With a background in computer science as well as analog photography, I tend to look on digital images and inkjet printing as computer drawings rather than photographs. Black and white photography is a hands-on analog process. No computers, no inkjet printers, no Lightroom or Photoshop. To me, it's the challenge of making a silver gelatin print in my dark room that depicts the image as I envisioned it through the lens of my camera. So if we can move back to the photograph, to Matt's award-winning photograph, um, the barn is very ominous looking in this photograph. Um, so we, we asked Matt how he created such a moody composition, such a moody feeling. Well, mother nature in a foggy morning helped a great deal. In my mind's eye, I saw a dark moody print and exposed the film to create a darker low contrast negative. I also used a developer that enhanced the grain of the film while holding the contrast of the negative to the desired level. The final step was in the darkroom, printing on a lower contrast grade of fi traditional fiber-based paper to preserve the mood. So a lot of things that went into it. <laughs> I tell you, uh, traditional film photographers are really a craftsperson's mentality. They, they really love the process. Um, so who are artists that inspire uh, Matthew Brady? Well, my wife, Wendy DeVario, for sure. I can't draw a straight, straight line with a ruler and I'm always amazed at the work she does. Photographers would have to include Ezra Stoller, Ezra Stoller and Bill Morris, French photographer, photographer Henri Cartier-Brinson, Alfred Stieglitz, Edward Weston, and of course, Ansel Adams and Fred Archer. And last we asked uh, Matt where we can, people can find more of his work. And at the moment, at Gad Starts. <laughs> Very good. Um, and we're thinking of Maddie. He's dealing with a, a health issue, so he could not be with us tonight. Um, so keeping him in our thoughts. So moving on to second place award winner, Angie, were you going to introduce that? Yes. Absolutely, and our artist. This is Sal Guastella. Um, Grace, would you actually mind reading what the um, juror said about uh, Sal's work? Not at all. So Aja said, what are the two of the most joyful things in life? Dogs and springtime. I very much appreciate the kinetic feeling of the bright colors and patterns that seem to celebrate the beauty of life. So the second place award has gone to Pero de Mi Primavera from 2019. Now this mixed media um, piece is uh, on the larger side, it's 36 by 24. So it's very um, hard to miss in the gallery. Um, Sal, welcome. We're so excited that you're here to tell us more about your piece. So this is such a lighthearted and joyful painting as Aja uh, was obviously captured, captivated by it. Can you tell us what inspired you to combine dogs with springtime in such a pleasant way? I love animals and I love dogs 
and springtime is the beginning of everything. And I've always had animals. I've always had dogs and cats and, and, and pets. Um, so to me, combining the two was, was kind of, you know, it was very common sense. It was like, you know, that's what, you know, what, what life is about. I mean, enjoying a, a, an animal at the same time that you enjoy the beginning of, 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 of a whole season of spring, you know, it's, 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 it's a no brainer. It's, it's, it's really cool. It's really cool. And what um, many of us who are just looking at it on a screen can't really tell, but this is a very much a relief piece. So it's mixed media because there are, this is not a flat surface. Can you tell us, you know, describe a little bit more about the um, relief part of the piece? Yeah, I, you know, I, I started painting. I mean, I'm talking about in the, in the 19, late 1960s. I started painting, but I decided that, that what I liked um, was the 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 relief part of it but i'm I, i'm not a sculptor i have no clue how to sculpt something yeah um so um so i just did kind of these relief things and i started adding things to the, the paper and adding things to the canvas and then um i i i I enjoyed it and that that was part of it it's like I enjoyed it, it was it was kind of like being a kid again doing making toys or making creating something that didn't didn't exist before you know uh, and so it was it was fun to do um, and I couldn't go wrong I mean you know in art you can't go wrong you know when people tell you 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 know that's that's not a successful piece or something I mean I don't I don't know what that means um, to me, any artist that does anything is successful. And that's what's cool. What's cool is that it just, it's, it's, a, it, 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 it's, a, it's a, a fact of doing, not thinking, but doing. And that's what's fun. That's what's fun. It's just, you, you can't go wrong. You just start gluing things and start thinking about things and, and it all comes together sooner or later. <laughs> I love that. You um, might not love the piece. You might not love the piece, but you know, you'll go, oh, I'll do another one. You know. <laughs> I think that's a very positive outlook and something that I, I hope everybody thinks, um, you know, art is for everyone and everyone can make art. So that's awesome. Exactly. So tell me, how did your migration from Cuba as a child affect elements in your work? For instance, color palette or subject matter, or did it? Yeah, of course. I, you know, I came to the United States when I was uh, turning nine years old. Um, so I have that cultural background of in Cuba and very colorful, of course, because, you know, it's a Caribbean kind of thing with African influence and the music. I mean, I, I paint by music. I mean, I, I cannot paint without having music in my studio. So I, I, I enjoy that fact of of you know carnival and i remember the, the the carnival in cuba when i was eight years old or even younger i just remember the colorful um ambience that i lived in even when we went to church which i hated you know because it was like too long and it's like this guy was talking and that but i would look at all the statues and all the the incredible decorations it was it was it was it was to me it was unbelievable um that that was made by people uh I, you know i didn't realize how awful the history of it was <laughs> but but you know as a as a young kid you don't see that you just see this incredible embellishment of everything um and everything that i was surrounded with was very colorful uh, including music and and food and of course the, anything that was visual so that really that 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 did it for me that yeah. you know i i love color um and and i i love the fact that i could just put down a color and not have to explain it So in, in your bio, you talk about painting what you love most and find personally upsetting. So can you tell us about the subjects that fall into both categories? 
Well, I have, you know, I, I, I paint, you know, I paint things I, I love, but I also paint things I hate. And, um, you know, and, and, and there's, there's people that, that will relate to that and will, will, you know, will, will want to watch and look at, at and maybe even purchase um, paintings that are a little tougher, a little tougher. Um, I remember I, I was doing an art show, boy, in like 1971 in Winter Park, and this lady came by and, and she looked at my booth and she goes, oh, I love that painting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to buy it. I'm, I'll buy that painting. And I'll say, okay, so <clears throat> do you know what that painting is about? And she goes, oh, it's just beautiful. It's a lot of color. And she goes, I want it for my, my, my kid's room. And I said, ma'am, that's a run over dog. <laughs> I did a painting that was about a run over dog in, in Sweetwater and, you know, in like 1970. Um, and, it was it, it was grotesque, but it was so colorful that she didn't see the grotesque part. She just saw the color. So actually, you know, one of those crazy things, um, I talked her out of buying the piece. So I do a lot of pieces that are very colorful, but people mistakenly look at it as, oh, that's cartoony, that's, that's cute. And then they start looking at it and go, oh my God, wait a minute. That's not so cute. So I can get away with a lot of things that, that I do uh, enveloped in, in the color and cartoony kind of style that I've always done. Um, where other people just put it in your face, I, I get a little more, um, I get a little more distance out of my paintings because people have to really look at things uh, and, and, and realize that, you know, that's not that pretty of a thing you know that's that's a real you know statement regarding something that i do dislike or not like you know but i also do you know paintings that you know because i'm i'm very positive so i i like you know i like to do paintings that are you know that that thrill me you know that that, that i like to look at and and rejoice over what i'm doing so it's cool. It's I can do anything, you know, and that's the thing about art. You can do anything. Um, well, so tell me, who are some artists who inspire you? Oh, geez. I started, you know, I, I, I wrote it. <laughs> I went, okay. So I, that question, I went, oh, um, and I started to write down and I went, oh, my God. I mean, I can't. I, I can't. I mean, the first thing that came to my mind was uh, Mary Cassatt for her courage to be able to paint at a time that only men were painting and the women were only being of models. So she had this courage to say, oh, I'm going to paint and I'm going to try and get my paintings, you know, with the Impressionists out there. But I mean, Walt Disney, uh, I love cartoons and toys. So that had a lot to do with it. But, you know, I'm talking about, I love a lot of stuff that I don't do. I mean, Kandinsky, I have Edward Mung, Paul Klee. I mean, I, I wrote Georgia O'Keeffe, but I, I, I don't, I would never paint like Georgia O'Keeffe, but I love her paintings. Uh, Frida Kahlo, of course, Dali because of surrealism. Uh, Christo, uh, you know, I loved Christo's, you know, curtains and, 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 and embellishing, you know, and covering mountains and things like that. You know, Jackson Pollock for, for having the, the courage to you know, throw paint down and that kind of stuff. And Helen Frankenthaler that was married to Mother uh, Motherwell, uh, but I like Frankenthaler better. Um, Rushenberg and um, Warhol, of course, in the 60s. So th the stuff that I love might not have anything to do with the stuff that I do. I don't know if you, you know, if, if that's yeah. clear. I, I, I can I can love you know a, 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 I can love pottery but I, I don't do pottery but I can love a fired you know dark fired or uh, pottery that 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 has these incredible glazes but I don't do that so it's kind of cool to be you know to be kind of influenced by a lot of things but not picking one and saying, Oh, I want to, I want to paint like that person. 
you know that's that's a that's a mistake that a lot of people do to 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 enjoy all this stuff and then to do what you do and of course you're gonna you you're gonna pick pieces from here and there about that but it's not just i i oh i love the way that person paints so i'm going to paint like that person right, that's a huge mistake but i love how that person paints i have no clue how to do any of that stuff but i still love how that person paints and i'm gonna do what i do and maybe get a little influenced by that person a little bit you know that well, kind of stuff. you know inspiration can come from anywhere so um, from anywhere exactly so I just want a uh, last question for you. What, um, where can we find more of your work? Uh, nowhere, because <laughs> I've done that. I've done the galleries. I've, I've had tons of galleries. I've, you know, all over the, the the country. I've done the the shows. I've done one person shows. I've done all that stuff. Um, and uh, I had a change of of life. You know, about twenty years ago. So I closed my studio. Um, and I started teaching, not teaching art, you know, even though I had a degree in art, I taught language, um, and I got a master's in teaching foreign language. So I put all my emphasis on that. Um, but I, 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 I didn't paint for 20 years and I've, I've just in the last few years started to paint, you know, and I still have my studio, my studio is in Woodville. So I still have my studio and I'm working to get my studio back up, you know, after 20 years of of not picking a brush, picking up a brush. Um, so I, I, I don't have any interest in, in anything except painting. And I told this, an ex student of mine that is a up and coming artist. And I told him, don't forget, it's the journey, not the destination. Because that's what I always, you know, remembered. It was the journey. Whether I sold pieces or I didn't sell pieces, or whether I had a gallery opening, a one person show, or I had a group show and I didn't sell anything or I sold something. It was the whole process of painting and I was gonna to continue to paint. So now I'm back, you know, in the, in the last couple of years, I'm starting to, to paint again. So I have no desire to have my work anywhere. I, it, it sounds it sounds inter it sounds weird, but it, it I I don't have any interest in selling my work. Or I don't anything. think it's weird at all. I think that you know, art is an expression of our human condition, and it doesn't necessarily you're not doing it for anyone other than yourself. And I will say that you are in our artist guild, and we do have your work on display um, occasionally in our guild exhibition, so you can see it at Gadsden Art sometimes. Oh <laughs> yes, yes, you're right, you're right. That's about the only place you can see it. That's fine. <laughs> And I love doing it. I love painting. So, you know. Well, it so. shows. You can really tell it in your work. I think it really comes through um, in your in your painting. So um, thank you so much, Sal. That was, that was really interesting. And I'm going to give it back to Grace now. So, Sal, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, and I, I'm grateful to you for being a part of Gadsden Arcs. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce our first place award winner, and um, this is sponsored by Capital City Bank. It is for this uh, beautiful watercolor entitled Dripping in the Fronds from 2019, a medium sized piece about 20 by 30 inches. And um, of this piece, our juror said, this sculpture feels like, um, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong piece. Hang on a second, this piece, um, Aja said, dripping in the fronds is a masterpiece in the true definition of the word. The beauty of this painting is threefold for me. The lovely light and shadow throughout the painting, the crisp lines the artist has created, and the great composition. Um, and I have to tell you, Sherry, that this piece was one of the ones that initially spoke to me when I first walked into the gallery to see everything installed and lit. So um, I'd love to ask you some questions about it um, and about your work as an artist. So in your artist bio, you mentioned that you've been interested in depicting wildlife since your graduate thesis exhibition in 1978. How have some of your ideas or approaches to the subject changed since then? Yeah, um, when I was in college, we were encouraged to 
paint large. I painted four by six feet, uh, eight by 10 feet, I think was my largest one. I used acrylic paint and um, I mostly painted jungle scenes where I either made up animals or and plants or imagined them, put them into scenes uh, that were not real, very realistic, but just out of my mind. And then I also looked up, you know, whatever details I needed of the animals in reference books, because this was in the 70s and I didn't have a lot of access. I didn't have a digital camera. I didn't have a lot of access to see what, what everything looked like. Um, I, I did things like, you know, I had campfires where that, were, that were in day glow with rhinos gathered around the campfire and the glow reflected in the horns. And I did uh, like a marabou stork looking over a, a, a mountain landscape in the back and um, looking at a monkey. And these were pretty much two-dimensional. They were very flat shaped and they had a, a you know, stylized to them. Um, so I didn't paint all when I worked. Uh, so for almost 40 years, I did not paint at all. And when I retired, I went to a couple shows by the Tallahassee Watercolor Society. And I was really inspired by uh, the, the work and the luminosity of the colors. And I decided, you know, I wanted I wanted to, to work in watercolor. And after a few workshops, I started painting. This was about six years ago. Um, my painting is quite different now. I uh, bought a really good camera and a lens, and I spend a lot of time at places where animals are, like rookeries and um, zoos and wildlife preserves. I go to countries that have animals, like the Galapagos, um, Costa Rica. I went, I'm going to Kenya in uh, October. And the animals I pick now are, are the animals I show now are very up close and personal. Um, they're more like the, the, land, the work that I did at, in college was more like a landscape. And these are more like portraits of the animal. Um, so there's quite a few differences. So one thing I noticed about your work, um, and I can see it in these examples as well, um, the work in the museum is you have this very, very, bright sense of light, this just brilliant sense of light in your pieces. Can you talk about that? Well, I really look for images that have a strong sense of dark and light, because I like the focus to really um, come out at you. Like in the, the bird's head and neck are very bright against the dark fronds. So the background kind of frames the bird in that case. And when I take photographs, you know, I look for that, but I also manipulate photographs and manipulate my painting to be what I want it. And so I push the color up, I push the light up and the dark's darker. So, you know, if, if you were to see the regular photograph of this, it wouldn't be the same. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you've kind of answered the next question. So your, your images, your paintings are very, realistic visually, um, they're photo-like, um, and you've kind of answered this already, I think, but um, so why not take a photograph? Well, I think there's a, a different quality in the, uh, there's a physical quality to a painting that I just don't think you get in a photograph. Photographs can be manipulated uh, post, in post-processing to make, make it look however they want, but I don't see, think you see the drips, I don't think you see the blossoms, I don't say, think you see the, uh, the characteristics of the paint uh, as in a real painting. And, um, you know, there's a style that most artists have and, and that's generally not available in a photograph. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of what I do is, is little masking of repetition of patterns. And um, I guess maybe you could get that in a photograph, but I don't think so. I think there's just a different physical quality, you get to see some of the work by the artist, you know, you, you want to see the struggle. <laughs> the dripping of the birds, uh, the color in the bird and the dripping of that through the fronds, you know, I just don't think you get that in a photograph. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. So, um, so how do you consciously use color to create a connection between the viewer and the animal or between you and the animal, some kind of emotional <laughs> Some kind yeah, of an emotional think, feeling with this. Yeah, and I think color is emotional. We all respond to it on an emotional level. I think if your response is different if you see vivid colors or if they're muted. Um, I choose very vibrant colors. I'd like to get the viewer's attention. And, um, you know, I like to, um, 
uh, change the color or heighten it in many cases. Uh, I've painted frigate birds that are black, you know, bright iridescent blues and greens. Uh, you know, I painted uh, rosette spoonbills. I don't de deter too much because they have such a brilliant color scheme anyway. But a lot of the color I have, uh, you know, tries to heighten it, get the viewer's attention, and um, you know, have some understanding of, of the bird, I'm, you know, uh, or the bird or the animal through the color and uh, to hold the viewer's interest. Well, I also noticed in your compositions with the spoonbill and the um, spoonbill and the American alligator, some of your subjects are looking right at the viewer. Yeah. So that the eye, the eye is your attention. Yeah, the eye, you know, is uh, often the focus, you know, and if you can get that looking at the viewer, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's something you can't hardly ignore. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, so who are some artists that inspire you in, in your work, if any? Well, um, I'm a fan of Carol Carter. I met her two years ago at the Florida Watercolor Society. Um, I had a one-on-one -on -one session with her. She, you know, we had an opportunity to submit uh, some of our images to her and she reviewed those. And so we talked for about an hour and I was really inspired by her. She did demos at the conference. And then later I took a workshop from her. She's a very strong women artist and um, she does, her work is entirely different from mine, but I really admire it. It's very fluid. And even though like I'm, I'm really about a lot of these details, she's not very detailed, but in these big, brilliant washes, she captures the essence of the, of the thing she's painting. And uh, she did this whole exhibition um, in the pandemic that was quite uh, emotional. And so I, th I, I just think she's a very strong women artist and I kind of follow her right now. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, so other than Gadsden Arts, where can people find more of your work? Well, I have two paintings at City Hall in the Brushstrokes exhibition. I have one painting that will be in the Florida Watercolor Society's exhibition in Coral Springs in September. I'm also in the 10 Women Artists in Tallahassee and we display our work at I Associates. And then um, I do have a Facebook page, Sherry Allen Watercolors. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, for talking with me. Your work is, is really stunning. Thank you. Really, really. So let me pass um, the mic back to Angie. And she will introduce our best of show award-winning artist. Yeah, and I just wanted to say um, before uh, we go away um, to talk about our best in show is that you can't really tell from the um, from the uh, the the pictures on the screen, but her but Sherry, your work has the shimmery quality to it, and it's just I mean it really glows in the gallery, and it's just something that is so great to be able to see in person. Um, if people are able to make it to the museum, uh, the show is open through September eighteenth, so there's still time. And um, I love that about your work. Thank you. Okay, so our Best in Show Award winner, sponsored by Doug Crowley Insurance Services, um, goes to a sculpture this year. It is Behind the Facade by Mark Giorgiotis, um, created this year out of welded steel cut nails. And I just have a, um, a fun uh, thought behind, is that, am I not screen sharing? Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, you guys. It's hard would that to be helpful? Would you, would you like me to screen share? I can do that. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just sitting here chatting away. Good, are we good on, on yeah, screen good. sharing now? Okay, so sorry about that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, we well, was so excited to see this piece. And I will ask Grace, if you will read um, Aja's uh, uh, sure. statement real quick, and then, we, then I'll continue blabbering. Absolutely. So um, Aja said of this piece, this sculpture feels like a study in dualities. And that really intrigued me. This work is both mysterious and inviting, using masculine media and depicting a feminine form, the hard exterior and the visible transparent interior. These binary dynamics are executed so effortlessly. While looking at this sculpture, I also asked myself if she's putting her mask on or taking it off. Um, there's a lot that goes into this piece and I think our, you know, 
Aja was really attracted to um, so many aspects of it. And um, I have a, just a little fun fact about this, this piece that, you know, a, a while ago, um, I was cleaning out things at the museum and I found this bag of old steel nails that was probably left over from the hardware store days of Bell and Bates. And I thought, what am I gonna do with these old nails? You know, and Mark has been, helps us um, from time to time with lots of various tasks around the museum. And I said, Mark, do you have any usage for these nails? And he said, yeah, sure, sure, I'll do something. And then I was so excited when I saw what he created. It was just so um, fascinating. So Mark, we're so excited to talk to you today. And, um, you know, seeing this new work, we've, we've exhibited your work before and it's neat to see these uh, figurative sculptures. Now, can you tell me what it is about the figure or the human condition or form that interests you? Um, I've always been intrigued with the, the human form. I mean, I, I, I come from a mechanical background. I worked as a, a, a mechanic all my life. And I, I just see the human form as just the ultimate machine. And I'm, I'm just very intrigued with it. You know, the way the, the, the bones, the muscles, the tendons, the skin, everything connects together to make this just fabulous form. And it's just intriguing to me. Um, I, 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 like, I like living, I, li I like to work with living things, not only, you know, people, human forms, but I like, you know, uh, animals and bugs and all sorts of uh, living creatures. <laughs> I just find it very intriguing to work with these. So you, that kind of um, goes into, so you, you know, you worked as a mechanic and you said that, um, working as a mechanic has influenced your art making in terms of you like working on things that that are are moving or things that are are living yes um i i i, I guess um the, you know there's more emotion to something that's living instead of working with a you know an object that's that's not i mean i i have done sculpture before but I've never, you know, I want to create something that that has some sort of mood and feeling, you know, that creates a mood. And it, it, to me, it's hard to do with with something that's not a living, you know, creature. Well, so on this piece, speaking of you know working on something uh, that's living or not, so. You, can you tell me about the decision to use this kind of more masculine media, the the hardware, the nails, um, to depict this very feminine form, and, well, and why? What I wanted to do with this with this sculpt sculpture is I I I used a I used a store mannequin for my initial form because I wanted a generic kind of a generic form, but I wanted it. I wanted it female, um, somewhat female, somewhat almost androgynous. It's it's kind of I didn't want to uh, overemphasize the female features, but I wanted a tall, kind of a thin, um, you know, like like a generic, you know, just a generic form. So the mannequin was perfect for that, and. Um, I wanted to, like, I think I've told you before, I've used the word edgy. I, I'm not sure that's the right word, but I like to use um, material that is uh, sharp, somewhat dangerous, you know, somewhat um, uh, hard, cold, but use those materials to make something that's... Uh, you know, you know, like the human form, like uh, the female or, or the, you know, the, the actual uh, piece that I made. And I'm not sure if I'm conveying that right. <laughs> no, I think I, I understand what you're saying in terms of the using something that is very hard. I'm showing some other examples here. You know, these are all living, you know, capturing what are living forms, the horse and the, the um, wasp and the, um, 
the crow and the fairy. These are all things that would move. And so you're using a very static form, but there's still very a lot of movement in all of the pieces, even if they are static. And so you're able to do that with this, um, with this kind of harder material, the metals. And I think it's really interesting, you know, there is that kind of concept of duality between the hardness and then still capturing movement and um, especially in um, the figure, making it look so delicate with something that is, you know, hard, essentially hardware is nails um, and delicate and light. And, you know, we notice the, the very specific things that you chose to leave um, empty. It's kind of hard to tell from the picture, but if you see it in person, you know, the arm isn't, you know, you didn't, you didn't choose to close the arm all the way up at the, or the elbows or all the legs. Like there's a lot of space in between. Um, and so I think it's really kind of um, interesting that, that you do that. Um, and, you know, I did want to ask, like what Aja said, you know, is she taking the mask on? Is she putting the mask on or is she taking it off? Well, that's, that's the whole question. You know, I, I wanted to leave that up to the, the, the person viewing the, you know, the sculpture. And it kind of goes back, and I think I told you this before, a, there was an old Japanese saying that, you know, we have, we have three faces, you know, and the first face is the face that we show in public, you know, who we are in public. Uh, your second face is the face that we are around our family. Who are we around our family? You know, we, we're a different person than we are when we're out and about around, you know, in public around other people. And then the third face is who we see when we look in the mirror. You know, when we look in the mirror, you know, that's the face nobody really knows and nobody really sees. And to me, I was trying to portray that with pulling the face away, you know, maybe that the outside, the mask was, was the face in public. In between was somewhat the face, you know, at home. And then, you know, the open uh, partial, uh, of, you know, partial open head was, was, you know, what we are at home. I mean, by ourselves. So, it, I just wanted to leave it up to, you know, the, the person viewing it as to how they felt about it. And uh, as far as the, the, the spaces that I didn't fill in, that I, I try to leave negative space like that so your eye kind of follows and fills it in itself, you know. I, I think it would be less interesting if I completely filled everything in and made it, you know, you know, complete... Uh, sculpture. If you look at some of my other ones, uh, the horse, if you look at the horse, if you look at it to the side, the whole back end of the horse is missing, but yet your eye follows the curve around and kind of fills it in itself. Um, and as far as movement, I like to use a lot of wire and stuff that's not normally, I mean, the crow, I, I, I worked on the I focused on the head and the beak of the crow and the rest just kind of uh, flowed behind it. It's as if the crow was moving and that was the wind coming behind him, so. I think that that does show, um, you know, it comes across for sure. And um, so tell me a little bit about your process. Um, how do you go about creating these? I mean, I know with the nails, you use the mannequin form to help you get that shape you wanted. But what about in these other instances? Are you uh, just kind yeah. of seeing this in your mind's eye and shaping them out? Well, sometimes I, I will look up what the skeletal form of, a, of one of these objects are and kind of go from there and I'll kind of make a very basic skeletal form. And then the rest of it, I just start adding and welding pieces to it. And I will take pictures of it and, and, and get back and look at it. And I'll just, I'll just start, you know, just, just, just forming it. And I keep looking at it and I see something that doesn't feel right. And I just keep adding pieces until I feel like it's how I want it. Um, I don't. I don't spend a lot of uh, 
I don't spend a lot of time. I just, I actually just start on something and, and just, just keep adding pieces until I feel like it looks, you know, like I want it. And, and that's it. I, I, I really don't uh, put a lot of prep and, you know, preparation into it. <laughs> you just kind of have to do it. You just, you just, you know, have to create. That's, and um... and I, I usually focus on one area. Uh, like on the horse, I focused on the around the nose and around the, you know, the front part of the horse. If you look, that's the only part of the horse that maybe the ears that's not wire. Um, like on the um, the wasp, I, I I made a very sharp stinger, and it's you know it's kind of dangerous, and I kind of focused on that part. Um, on the on the fairy, if if you look at that close. I really detail the face, but the rest of it kind of fades away. Um, same thing with the crow, uh, or it's actually a raven. I, I focused on the beak, and the rest of it just kind of fades away. Hmm. And I, I don't like to make things symmetrical, and I, I like sharp edges. I don't know if you call that, uh, I, I guess, not brutalist, but it's that was my interpretation of being edgy. It's just a little rough around the edges. And the, uh, uh, I have a tendency not to clean up a lot of the edges. Um, I like to leave them uh, rough and ragged. I, I think it creates more of an emotion, you know. And okay. More of a mood. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, that said, so which artists inspire you? Well, um, I have a little story about that. When I was, um, I, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, I, I lived there until I was 13. And I don't know if you've ever visited Jacksonville. They have a park down on Riverside um, called Memorial Park. There's a, sculpt, there's a sculpture in the middle of that park that was put there for um, the World War I veterans. And I remember as a little kid, probably four or five years old, my parents taking me down there and I, I saw this sculpture and I was so moved by this. I, I, I just from day one, I wanted to be a sculptor. I wanted to do this. I, this is just, it, it moved me so much. And it's called the uh, Wing Vic Victory. It's, it's, a, it's a large ball and on top of the ball, is this um, human form with wings, but the ball is made up of parts of bodies. You, you'd have to see it, look it up. Wing, Wing Victory, Riverside Memorial Park. And I have ever since that, that day kept in my mind, this is kind of what I wanted to do. And, um, I, as a 14-year-old, I went and bought myself a welder at Montgomery Wards, and I just started welding and playing with metal. And um, and, I, and I, I paint. I like to paint, but a lot of times I use my painting to facilitate, you know, my uh, sculpture. Um, some of the people that have, and the name of that artist that created that sculpture was Charles Pilar. Um, but some of the other people that have inspired me is another sculptor called uh, Anthony Gormley. Um, my neighbor up the street uh, inspires me is Carrie Ann Bada. Um, I have another friend, uh, Ron Airbedra. I, I'm just fascinated with his work. He, he does a lot of figures and um, he, he completely inspires me. And my father, who was an artist, uh, he was more of an illustrator, but uh, he inspired me. Wow, that's um, that's so interesting, and what a um, great um, example of why arts education for children is so important, and is exposing them to art at a young age. Um, just, it's amazing what an impact that can have, and public art as well. So I think that's pretty awesome. Um, uh, I think. We're um, about out to our um, getting wrapping this up. Grace, I'm going to um, have it go back to you. Oh, you're muted.
couldn't find my mouse cursor. Um, <laughs> Mark, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I have to tell you, um, I was really excited about the quality of all the work in Art and Gadsden this year. We just have had tremendous shows in recent years. To get accepted into Art and Gadsden is remarkable now with um, 99 works by 88 artists accepted this year. And each of your pieces were ones that stood out and spoke to me when I walked into the space um, after Angie and Chris finished installing. Uh, Mark, I'm fascinated with the way negative and positive space interact in your piece, how the figure seems to dissolve into space. Um, all three of these pieces are fun to look at and make you think. And to me, that moves it from the realm of an attractive piece to a really powerful piece of art when it really invites people to interact with it and stop and look and consider it. Um, and what a great thing to do to get lost in art right now with all that's happening in the world. Uh, these successive waves of COVID that we're dealing with. Um, it is just a wonderful thing to walk into our gallery and interact with these. Um, so as Angie mentioned, this exhibition is up until September 18th. The video will be up long term. We keep these archived on our YouTube page so you can share this with family and friends and we will continue to share this with our um, public. We have a wonderful group of exhibitions coming up this fall after this closes, opening in October. Five exhibitions dedicated to women artists uh, and women who were first door pioneers in art. The major exhibition is Four Centuries of Creativity, Women Artists from the Reading Public Museum. And we're also bringing an installation piece from a nationally acclaimed installation artist by the name of Senga Nangudi. Um, who has been very, very well known in the art world since the 1960s. So those two are our major shows, um, but also celebrating the work of women artists from the region. And um, we're thrilled with the uncertainty of COVID that we had already taken the approach of planning live online programming for the, these exhibitions in partnership with the National Museum of Women in the Arts, the Reading Public Museum and Art Bridges, so um, as well as Florida Humanities. <clears throat> so we have a number of different presentations that go with that collection of shows. I hope you'll join us for those. Um, so in the meantime, we would love to see you back out at Gadsden Arts um, to continue to enjoy what we have there through the middle of September. And um, I appreciate you all again for signing on with us tonight. I hope you have a great Great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.